All right, so welcome back after uh, the break. Uh, Matiz will join us uh, in a moment. So uh, we've organized this panel uh, to look into some of the use cases about LoRaWAN. So we talk a lot about the technology, but it's really about the applications and how it's used and what are the real advantages on the market this gives that are the important part and actually drive the use cases, the sales, and the growth of uh, the use of this technology. So uh, today we've uh, invited uh, three companies to show some different use cases. Uh, firstly, uh, Mr. Clement Logar from Silvera Links will be introducing some industrial solutions uh, for energy monitoring. Uh, then Mr. Dayan Jancic uh, from Pestle Instruments will be introducing the uh, Meadows uh, group of projects and a lot of use cases in the environmental sector. And Matisse Scherz uh, that just joined us uh, from uh, Elmitel and uh, the product eVineyard will introduce a very specific use case which is growing in global traction for vineyard management. So I'll ask each of the panel participants to uh, give a short presentation and then we'll open up the panel for discussion. So Clement, please. Yeah. Hi everyone. Thanks for hosting us. Uh, hopefully the, the case study we're going to present is going to be interesting enough. Uh, it's not maybe the most excited, uh, exciting use case, but uh, definitely use case that is profitable and actually uh, kind of a brings the added value to the customer. That's the most important at the end. Uh, maybe before I start my session a few words about the company not sure if all of you know Silvera Links uh, Silvera Links is energy management company working on energy management solutions since 2002 uh, of course we were not talking about the IOT at the time but uh, we are doing remote monitoring using different kind of technologies uh, since the beginning uh, we've developed our own software solutions we have our own hardware communication devices uh, connecting or using different kind of technologies from GSM, GPRS uh, to LoRaWAN. Uh, on today's case, I'm going to present industrial use case uh, using LoRaWAN technology in well-known cement company, Saloni uh, I believe it's one of the uh, top uh, European cement companies, maybe not in size, but definitely in production. Uh, they have 90 years of history, 25 buildings uh, in the kind of a really narrow valley that spreads around uh, within three kilometers. And the buildings are quite scattered around, so uh, this is basically the reason we chose an Allura technology. Uh, what's important to say when it comes to use cases, uh, it's not going to be about Allura one all the, all the time, right? So uh, as you uh, as my uh, colleagues mentioned before, there are some limitations on LoRaWAN, so uh, there are specific use cases that can be uh, used, uh, or LoRaWAN can be used for specific use cases implementing that particular technology. But in this case, it uh, has proven to be uh, well efficient, um, and um, there was quite a huge added value for the customer because uh, the production facilities are quite old. There was no real chance to wire the whole plant. All the meters are scattered around uh, pretty much uh, through all three kilometers, so there were no way to wire the whole system and uh, use different kind of technologies. Uh, yeah, the challenge was actually the, the bill, the energy bill. As you can see, the cost of the consumed energy per year is around 5 million euros. Uh, spreading from electrical gas energy and technological water. Uh, this is actually the architecture that we used. We built the private network for them, so we set up three gateways. Uh, why three? Because there was no way to gather all the data from one uh, gateways. Uh, one gateway. Why? Because of the uh, uh, of the company scattered around throughout three kilometers area. That's the, the, base, the, the biggest reason why we set up three 
different gateways. Uh, of course, in that case, we're using uh, network server provider. In our case, it was Actility, but uh, since we are a TTN network today, uh, we use and we are integrated with TTN network as well. And from the network manager server, which is there in order to communicate or have pro pro provide proper management between uh, data collection and the gateways. And at the end, we are using our own software application called GammaLogic and uh, our own sensor devices or communication devices called Combox. This is actually the architecture of our solution. So we can use different uh, inputs from Modbus, Modbus TCP, MBus, to pulse temperature, status on off sensors and so on. Again, using different kind of technologies. Today we are, today we are focusing on LoRa 1 uh, through different protocols, either GSM, Ethernet, LoRa to gamma logic, and uh, since we're talking of, about the energy consumption, energy management, we want to manage our consumption. So uh, that's why we always take into consideration external data uh, weather conditions as well, especially if we are doing monitoring on the temperature side, for example. Uh, one ad another option of gamma logic is uh, integration with ERP systems or external databases, that can be done as well. And every user can, of course, analyze their own data, uh, doing their own reports and dashboards. So we installed altogether 36 Combox devices certified with LoRaWAN, 11 uh, gas meters, 10 water meters, five uh, sensor force compressed air, and 10 for electricity meters. So all the data was gathered from our Combox device, which is connected to the network server sending the information or data payload directly through to network management server and from there on to our Gamma Logic. So the, the architecture or the workflow is pretty much quite uh, easy. So we collect the data from the meter, we wire the meter with uh, uh, two wires, connect our Combox device, before we do that, of course, we kind of attest what's the signal. This is one of the most important things. If you want to talk about the battery life, then you need to make sure the sig you have a proper signal in place. Otherwise, you're gonna, the, the battery life is going to drain quite fast. Uh, the second uh, parameter that you have to look into is data sending, uh, sending interval. So in our case, we have uh, kind of a, quite a few of advantages with our communication device. What we did uh, is we developed the data logger as well. So we're not, uh, in case we have an interruption in the network, we are gathering 100 logs, 100 less logs. And uh, once the network is on again, we are sending the, the data. Uh, the data sending interval and data collection interval can be different, so we can for example, collect data on uh, one minute, 15 minutes, one hour interval, and sending it, uh, for example, every four hours in order to uh, increase the battery life. So those are real, very important parameters when uh, you decide about the technologies to be used uh, for remote monitoring. Uh, this is how the project actually looks like. So uh, we set up the, the curling gateways on the rooftops, and below you can see LoRaWAN devices uh, equipped or uh, installed on the gas pipe in this case. This is uh, why the three gateways, as you can see, the, 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 uh, the whole factory is quite narrow and long, so we decided to build or to install three different gateways. The bigger dots are the three gateways, and the, the smaller dots are actual meters that we are collecting data from. Uh, of course, we have our own solution, as mentioned, Gamma Logic, uh, where every customer can build their own ad hoc reports. Uh, the software is TOV certified. It has ISO 50001 certification. Why I'm pointing this out? Because um, by regulation in Slovenia, every big company with consumption, I believe, more than 50 euros per year has to do energy audits. Uh, now this is a regulation for uh, bigger companies, uh, but the regulation for smaller companies is uh, on the way, I think. 
and uh, by doing by having those regulation you have to do energy audits every four years uh, it shows uh, it showed up that uh, energy audits are not really efficient if you don't really track and manage your energy consumption afterwards uh, the, the cycle goes uh, you put, uh, decrease the cost and then without uh, proper management of your energy consumption the uh, the consumption slowly increases uh, throughout the time. That's why we always uh, tend to bring in the monitoring or energy management solution in that aspect as well. Uh, this is how the software looks. Actually, we just launched uh, the latest new interface. I don't have the slides yet, but uh, you're all welcome to visit, at, visit us at our booth, and we'll be happy to show you our uh, solution. It's uh, built in uh, cloud. Uh, we have on-premise or on-cloud solution, uh, a little bit different uh, installation, as you all know. Uh, we are using Telecom Cloud, so it's well secured. We have a secured connection, and the data is encrypted through AS 100, uh, 129, 128. Uh, every customer can build their own reports. We have solved the geolocation and clock synchronization with our software because we are quite early adopter of LoRaWAN technology. We started back in 2014 and built our own first device, I believe, already in 2015. And uh, since a lot of things were not covered uh, at the time, uh, we saw them our way. So we can locate or we can show geolocation of our devices. Uh, geolocation of tank monitoring, for example, is really uh, a good use case as well. And this is the geolocation in the valley. So our gateways, uh, I believe this is, I'm not sure where this is. Um, since I don't have really much time, I'm going to finish now. But uh, if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate. You can ask now or later at the panel session. Yeah, let's have any questions at the panel session. Sure. OK. Perfect. Thanks. That will be all. Thank you, Clement. So I would like to invite uh, Mr. Dan Andrich uh, from Bessel Instruments. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, uh, from my side as well. I would like to tell you uh, a little bit more about uh, company Pestle Instruments and solutions that we are providing. So I would like to say that we are a startup that is uh, 32 years old. So. <laughs> It's a little bit different. So we were uh, starting uh, our business in this segment 32 years ago when most of the things were not invented and we were one of the pioneers in using of sensors and uh, electronics in the uh, field of agriculture. So we started uh, uh, a long time ago and today we are uh, in all five continents. We have uh, more than 18 subsidiaries, but we are having only 105 people, so it's very challenging task with so small team to develop, research, integrate, develop platform, infrastructure, devices, manage the solutions and provide the technical support for huge number of uh, users globally. So we have at the moment more than 45,000 units which are having 10 and more sensors, the, the, uh, displayed in, uh, in different parts of the world. So this is a network of our station, how it looks so far. So you, you may see that we have quite a big presence in Europe that we are developing in Africa in the countries who can afford it and where we have a stable agriculture and agronomy. Uh, we started uh, our uh, expansion in US uh, last year and it's already visible where we have our employees. So that means they earn their salary. So. If he's living here, he did a quite a good job. Then we see how the development goes uh, in Latin America. We see that in Brazil, there are still lots of green spaces. And on those green spaces, there is no cellular signal. So we have to go with alternative technologies. And we have to cover the huge agricultural area where they have a big need for uh, smart and precision agriculture. The same is as well in Australia, but in Australia was a different situation. Australia has changed the frequencies of uh, network last year, so we had to replace all the modules inside of our devices. And of course, Australia is as well 
uh, area with big spaces which we have to cover with private ne networks. The same is as well in some areas of Russia. So how does uh, our solution look like? So you can see that we have different type of devices for different applications. We have a classical meteorological stations for monitoring of uh, environmental conditions and parameters of uh, climate. Then we have a weather station that have been used for the touristic purposes, for the production of uh, fruit, vegetables in glass houses. For the irrigation, we have devices in orchards. This is, for example, uh, one test site where we have placed all together 300 stations and installed as a nationwide uh, network of uh, solutions in agriculture. Then we have camera devices. In Vietnam, we, uh, we are provider of uh, devices for the disaster prevention. We have uh, classical devices in production of uh, uh, flowers, in the production of uh, material for transplanting, practically in all areas of agriculture and uh, production of uh, elements. So just to give you a short idea what means uh, vertical of agriculture and what kind of needs they have. So uh, as a very basic start in agriculture, it's very important to have a stable uh, track of record of uh, weather data and climate conditions. So if you have adverse climate condition, it's very important to uh, know when is the proper moment for your seeding, for placement of the seed into soil, that you get as fast as possible germination and that you get the biggest yield you can. Then the second very important part is weather forecast. You have to know uh, what kind of weather you will have in front of you that you allocate quite limited resources in the format of tractors, implements, machinery, and uh, human resources, and you have to know when the rain will come, how big it will be, do you have to irrigate or you have to stop to irrigate, when you can enter the field at all. So we are providing as well services of hyper-localized weather forecast, so we are getting the uh, satellite pictures, images, we are processing them through the meteorological modems, and then we calibrate it with Kalman filter to get the hyper-localized weather forecast for the every single plot where we have the crops under surveillance. Then we have crop health management. If you see crop health management, uh, it could trigger lots of questions what it is actually. But last 60 years, uh, uh, science in the area of agronomy has developed and discovered that pathogen of different diseases has a behavior that is fully dependent on climatic conditions. So we are monitoring climate conditions, so we are reading them every five minutes, accumulating them, sending them to the cloud, and all these data are processed here, uh, went through the uh, models for disease calculation, and we are showing the risk when infection of certain crop and disease will start, and giving the recommendation to the farm manager that he should think what kind of measures he will take to prevent infection. Then we have insect monitoring. We have special devices, which are camera devices, which are taking pictures of the traps where you attract different insects, and you count them, recognize them, send a warning to the farmer that he has to take some measures. The same is as well with remote field monitoring. We have situations that farmer cannot be on 10 fields in the same time and uh, events are happening there. So this system is uh, uh, monitoring, giving a, a recommendation on a, a certain events in, the, in the, this particular crop and uh, uh, giving recommendation for the measures that have to be taken. Water management, we have seen lots of solutions in water management. So we are monitoring soil moisture down to 1.2 meter every centimeters. So we are monitoring temperature, humidity, electrical conductivity. We are trying to giving the full scan of uh, environment in a certain crop and giving recommendation to the farmer how much water he should add and how much he can save, uh, having in mind weather forecast in front of him. Then we have uh, irrigation automation, so we can remotely control start or stop of irrigation uh, and combine it with sensing of the uh, water in the field and combining it with optimal water balance of the crop because we know for the different stages, for the different crops, how much water it needs. As well, we have devices for nutrition management, so we are taking sample of the soil and giving the uh, elements about uh, macro elements, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and uh, giving recommendation on fertilization but as well when to apply fertilizer. If you apply it in wrong moment of time, you have uh, crystallization, you have uh, uh, loss of fertilizer or wash out fertilizer because of the rain that is coming in front. 
then work tracking, so we have trackers, active and passive, on different types of connectivity uh, that we put on the tractor or implement and telling which machine, when, was in which field, that we have full traceability and we can uh, follow what was the root cause analysis of certain events in the field, in the crop, and uh, uh, in transport between the final storage. We are monitoring storage tanks, we are taking the satellite images, processing them, putting them all together to the field level and over the platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and service as a service, we are divide, uh, delivering information to the farmers over the uh, computers, mobile devices, or we provide possibility to integrate our solution over API to different solutions uh, that are developed by partnering companies. So just a few words about connectivity. LoRa for us is very important way of connectivity in the areas where we are having problems with any kind of signal. And you know that uh, today cellular technology is mainly available in the cities. So uh, rural areas, uh, fields of agriculture are known that there is no energy, there is no any signal, and we have to provide complete infrastructure that farmer could get the final uh, result for the precision agriculture. So we are uh, as I said, pioneers who worked on all type of connectivity except of the, on the smoke signal, but uh, if the cameras are developing, maybe we will use even that connectivity. So just to tell you how the typical device uh, looks like, so this is one device that is uh, fully independent, self-sufficient in the agriculture, so it has a rechargeable battery and solar panel despite of low power network we are using. Uh, uh, in agriculture, we have to monitor events every few minutes, and we collect them and send them every 15 minutes, half an hour, and or hour to our central cloud where they are processed. If you have a frost, if you are 15 minutes late, you don't have to come uh, to the field that year to collect your harvest. So you can imagine, imagine what kind of damage you can have. As well, uh, our systems are uh, possible to connect more than 3,000 different types of sensors, uh, uh, for different applications. Normally it has up, uh, up to 10 sensors and uh, they are really uh, deployed in every, uh, every field. Our idea is that with LoRa network uh, that we deploy another thousands of devices into the fields and where we will uh, monitor all the events in the environment because climate is very local. Sometimes you can have a rain that catch only part of your field and it is very important that you know in which area it happened, that you know how to uh, implement measures for prevention of infection and uh, uh, where you have to add water if you didn't have a rain in the field. So for us, the main advantages of LoRa technology is low connectivity costs. It may see that it's not important, but if you, if you have 50 or 100 devices, and if you uh, use a simple SIM card, which costs 50 euros per year, it's a lot. Then a low power consumption. It's not just because uh, it takes uh, uh, just less power. It's because uh, we have to make sure that we will have enough power, not just for connectivity, but as well for sensor reading. Minimal operation costs, so with uh, this device, which we put on LoRa technology, we can have a sustainable system for a couple of years without touching it. Of course, we have to do mechanical uh, cleaning because sometimes birds are sitting here and doing some nasty stuff, so we have to clean uh, the things after them. And of course, simplicity of use. So you put the device in the field, you press the button, and it runs. So you get all your information in the cloud, you get it on your mobile phone, and you supervise uh, the fields that can be thousands and thousands of kilometers away. And of course, in agriculture, whomever tells you that energy is not important, it's false. In agriculture, we need frequent communication, but we don't have a cables and energy. So we have to harvest everything what we can and use it on the best way to, to get this data and information back to the field. So what we are really doing, we are producing IOTs in the field. We provide decision support systems. We do the analytics. We uh, give the advices for the irrigation. We uh, manage the workforce management. And main aim is to have sustainable ag agriculture, less inputs, less consumption of water, energy, fertilizers, uh, prevent uh, soil erosion, and of course, uh, to reduce the risk with the basic need of the farmer to have higher yield. 
of high quality crop. And that is in short. So if you have some question, I will be glad to answer. Perfect. All right, and last I would like to invite uh, Matisse uh, Charles from Emitel to also present the in vineyard product. And after that, we'll follow up with the panel discussion. So please do think of a few questions to ask our panel. Thank you, Luca. Uh, so yeah, my name is Matit. Uh, I'm coming from the company Elmitel. Um, as Mr. Dean did a very good introduction to what is possible in agriculture uh, right now with the help of IT, IoT, and all of those things, uh, I will go a bit more specific into a particular solution uh, for the vineyards that we are developing. Uh, so we are a company Elmitel, which is developing the software called eVineyard, um, which I will yeah, speak a bit about. Uh, and in the area of irrigation, we are working with a company called Vinduino from California, uh, which is developing the devices, uh, IoT devices, which communicate with the vineyard over LoRaWAN. Now, to, to go a bit more in detail, uh, what is eVineyard? eVineyard is a software platform um, which covers all of the aspects of wine growing in a very user-friendly way uh, that the farmers can easily use, comprehend, which is very adapted to the workflow of, the, of growing uh, permanent crops such as wine growing or growing crops that grow trees. Um, the platform offers solution for most of the, most of the things they, that can be solved with the help of the IT. Um, this means that the farmers can uh, record their events, they can uh, print some paperwork, analyze their costs, as well as yes, track their uh, activities with the GPS, as well as they get certain uh, decision support about when to spray, when to irrigate, and so on, as Mr. Dean recently uh, introduced that all of those things are possible in agriculture. And um, where we work with Laura, where we work with uh, the company Vinduino is on the area of uh, IoT devices which are put in the vineyard um, and designed to help with optimizing the irrigation. So Vinduino devices are measuring uh, soil moisture at different depths. They feed this data over the, uh, over the Laura and then internet into eVineyard. Um, and Eveniard then processes this data and controls the irrigation controller devices. Uh, so maybe on this slide it is a bit more explained how the, how the architecture looks like. Uh, we have the devices deployed in the vineyard. They communicate with the LoRa gateway. This communicates with the Things Network cloud. Uh, and with Eveniard we basically connect to the Things Network cloud. Uh, to fetch the data as well as to push the data back to the controller devices to complete the loop. Um, now, why farmers like the solution? As Mr. Dean explained, basically, IT solutions can help the farmers produce better crops uh, and help them spend less money on, on producing those crops. Um, in case of irrigation, we have some very good track record from California, from USA, uh, from the past year. We saved quite uh, a large number of, uh, actually, golf courses uh, of, of irrigation. Um, the solution is easy to maintain, so it's set and forget, except, of course, for some cleaning and such things. Uh, and this is very cost effective. Um, this brings us maybe to the next thought, why Laura One in agriculture? So one of the main uh, points, as you already heard today, is this fact that you can expand coverage where there is no coverage. Uh, in some areas, there is coverage of cellular signal, mainly in the cities, in, outside of the cities. Uh, you're left with basically this solution. Uh, low maintenance, uh, as said, the battery in the devices can last for a long time if you have a solar panel as well. Um, it can allow basically for set and forget installation. Uh, the devices are also not too costly. So what we have seen with the traditional uh, stations and devices, they are often very high, very high priced, uh, too high priced for, for the farmers to finally buy them. Um, and they, they are easy to set up. So if the de device is preset, uh, it can be easily sent to the farmer that they deploy it themselves without any special configuration on 
prior to the field. Uh, this is how it looks in Temecula Valley. This is uh, close to, somewhat close to Los Angeles on the, in the Southern California, where we have this network deployed. Uh, this is the, the first one. Uh, so you can see on the map the things network gateways, uh, and in this area we have yeah quite a nice number of growers uh, and sensors deployed that are using the solution. Um, of course, LoRa is also having certain difficulties. Uh, we learned that when bringing the the technology from the U.S., for example, to the European Union, there are certain uh, yes differences, as you probably heard or will hear. Uh, in terms of which uh, frequencies are available and so on. Uh, some of the things are still on the way to maturity. So we learned, for example, that different gateways don't always completely implement the, the standards. So sometimes the, the times in communication are a bit uh, longer than they should be according to the standard and so on. Different gateways. Um, then it is impossible to update firmware over the air, of course, because of the limitations of the protocol. And also, uh, testing and debugging can be, according to our experience, uh, this is yeah, more on a technical level, can be sometimes uh, a bit more difficult, especially because of these non-real-time communications. But yeah, despite those drawbacks and positive things, all of those drawbacks are the consequence of some, um, uh, of some design principles which are there in order to provide the benefits. So as we already heard there are certain benefits and, and drawbacks, but despite everything, we believe that LoRa in uh, certain cases for agriculture makes a lot of sense. And I would yeah, conclude the presentation with this thought. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, thank you for all the presentations. Um, so I'd like to kick off with a question that you all touched upon. Uh, the moon, but to put it very clearly, um, what did the Lora One technology enable you to do differently than everything else? So you come from different backgrounds. Um, for example, you know you've been using other technologies before, or you know this has been a new step. Um, so Clement, if we can start with you, um, can you you know just outline what is the real differentiator here? Why use this over other options? Yeah. So as I actually mentioned during my presentation already. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge with implementations of monitoring systems are uh, power supply, so wiring part, um, the signals, of course, and uh, the business cases, so what are the customer requirements. So when it comes to LoRaWAN, uh, we saw that uh, as a huge opportunity for us, for our potential clients that have challenges, uh, don't have budgets to wire the whole systems, the, the whole locations. And this is where we saw a huge advantage of LoRaWAN. Uh, this is one thing. Another thing, it's a, a lower cost solution. Uh, of course, with its limitations, but uh, if there's a uh, customer, uh, if there's a proper use case, let's say, then LoRaWAN fits best uh, as a proper solution. Now. In our case, I was talking about one industrial case, but uh, I'm, apart from that, we are quite strong on gas and gas companies uh, in Slovenia. So Plinarna Maribor is one of the of our customers. Uh, they decided to go with Lora One for their the monitoring of gas consumptions at their biggest customers. Uh, why? Because it was the most suitable solution, uh, cost-wise. Of course, there are limitations, but uh, we covered all the limitations uh, of uh, data sending interval. By regulation, they have to provide data, uh, so uh, actually forecasted uh, uh, consumption of their, the biggest the consumers have to provide a forecast, and they have to provide a forecast to Plinovadi, which is the system grid operator, and uh, it turned to be the best solution. Uh, all the, the other solutions were far more costly. Okay. So that was the, the biggest reason they decided to go with Laura. Uh, in that case, we set up the, they provide the locations for the gateways. Uh, we invested into the gateways because we are building the network, and uh, this is how we got the deal. So it was not that hard. Okay, perfect. Thank you. 
And uh, then you mentioned that you particularly use this where there's no other networking options. Can you weigh in on that a bit more? Yes, uh, of course, that, uh, that is uh, really related to the particular part of the world. So we have two main reasons why we are using LoRa. So in uh, European countries and in the area where we have already communities and network available, this is a preferred way of connectivity that farmers would like to use. They don't want to uh, have a big number of contracts with different uh, connectivity providers. So one of the aspects is cost of connectivity and liability. Uh, secondly, uh, there is a big need for deployment of huge number of devices. LoRa in European countries gave them a chance that with only one connectivity, if they uh, open their own uh, gateway, they can serve all the devices in the field. So you can imagine he can have 30 tractors, 50 implements, uh, 20 fields, and he can monitor different things on different positions. For them, it is saving a few thousand euros per month per uh, each uh, location where they have installation. In other parts of the world, we have lots of areas, uh, very, very developed areas, which are not interested uh, for placement of cellular technology because there's no people living there and they are not using internet and uh, uh, phone connectivity. You have seen the Brazil case. So in all these forests, there are really huge fields with thousands of hectares where we are practically giving a chance with the LoRa technology to have precision agriculture in every corner of Brazil now. So this is really a new ad advantage and uh, farmers, they are very happy that they can uh, finally have full solution and not to travel a couple of thousand kilometers with private planes to visit the field to see what's going on. They can uh, send the message directly uh, to the farm manager what kind of activity he has to do. Okay, perfect, thank you. And Matit, so did you guys with Vindino consider other technologies or what did become this? the primary solution and more also to weigh in why use the things network and maybe more of a public network and I would like to return to you guys on that part as well if uh, you can weigh on it. Yeah, so maybe if I first answer the, the second part why using the things network, uh, it's exactly this fact that uh, wherever the, the gateways are getting deployed, uh, we are getting the network there so if somebody else is also deploying the, the network, we're getting the, the gateways, we're getting the network in the area. Uh, so this is a this is a big thing, and yes, um, why considering this particular technology? Again, we come to the point that um, in the areas where, like like in Temecula, where the urban, main urban centers are uh, covered with a cellular coverage, but there are like hills and areas which are without signal, where you can deploy the gateways. Uh, it brings in the advantage and. We believe that this is one of the main advantages besides the fact that, yes, uh, the devices can be quite easily and cheaply pre-configured uh, for the certain area and easily deployed there, uh, which is not the case with, all right, car and cellular <coughs> situation in the future with narrowband IT, some things are going to change on that. Um, but today, easy deployment in the areas where there is no connectivity, um, this was the reason why we went that way. Okay, perfect. So, uh, yeah, really weighing in on this, that it's, in your case, not just your own network you're deploying for your customer, but you're just deploying a private network that you happen to use for your customer, but you still leave it public, essentially, on the TTN for everyone else to use. So, uh, and Dan, what's your take on this as you operate on a bit larger uh, scale? Does that work for you? Like, do you have any limitations, uh, problems with that? Uh, it works very well for us. We have uh, particular areas where we have high value crops. Uh, you see areas along the, the Steiermark here uh, mm -hmm. from both sides of the border. We have lots of vineyards. And uh, in the case of communities and uh, com communi community network, it's possible to cover 10, 20 orchards directly with one network, which can then easily transmit the data to central cloud. And there's another thing, uh, as a colleague has already mentioned, the problem of wires. A one meter of cable today costs two, uh, two euros. And if you have to wire something 100 meters, not to mention kilometers, it costs a really lots of money. With this technology and with the public networks, you are able to dis uh, place many devices as you need at practically no cost. 
And okay. if you see how much cost the, the, the module, the connectivity, and everything, so it's five meter of cable. Okay, perfect. So, a uh, question for you, Clement. Did you ever consider, or at least you know, talk to your customers, to transition their networks to be public networks as well, say, be included or peered with, say, TTN or anything along the lines? Yeah, Are there so any limitations on that from your side, um, you see? I don't really see big, bigger limitations there. Um, I see the cost of uh, having private networks elsewhere. First, in industrial cases, uh, you know, this data is kind of a, uh, confidential. So they are all afraid that uh, they're going to be somebody uh, trying to hack, get into the data, and steal the data. Uh, so in industrial cases, they all, most of the customers want to have their own private networks, not allowing anyone else to connect to existing gateways. But uh, we have a mix of that. So for some bigger industrial clients, especially owned by uh, by uh, uh, companies from elsewhere <laughs> worldwide, uh, they tend to use private networks. In other cases, uh, we tend to build up the private network, but uh, we use it for other clients as well. So it's not really a public one, okay. uh, but we do uh, make advantage or take advantage of already existing infrastructure and try to uh, connect other devices to it because at the end, you know, you have to calculate the returns, uh, return on investment. So there are uh, investment costs, you have to uh, find the place. Uh, if that's a higher place like uh, TV tower or uh, sure. GSM base station, then usually you have to pay for it. So they're renting out space. Uh, we were lucky with our bigger clients, uh, and since it's an industrial closed environment more or less, uh, we were lucky and easily installed gateway on, on the rooftops. Uh, but when it comes to more populated areas uh, within the cities, you might have a problem of uh, getting additional costs. And that's why you need to uh, install and connect as many as devices as you can in order to uh, have you know, cost benefit, profitable business at the end. Perfect. But So this opens up quite some opportunities maybe not necessarily having all the clients on public networks, although that would be the ideal case because there's yeah, added well, connectivity, but with peering coming in uh, in the future, correct. there might be quite some interesting opportunities here. This is how I see public networks being built, actually, because there always has to be a use case uh, behind. Otherwise, unless you get an investor that's going to invest millions to, to build out the network and cover all the, uh, the area, which is usually not really the case. And I see uh, building uh, the, an opportunity to build private, uh, public network, uh, as you mentioned. So building a lot of private networks and then doing the peering between all of them, allowing other clients to connect to the same network. Okay. I see that Perfect. as a growth potential, I think. Thank you very much. So I would like to open the floor for any questions uh, from the participants. Does anyone have a question uh, here? Would anyone like to mention some use cases or wonder what the best strategy is for this? Any questions from that side of the room? No? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'm from Gmund and we have also have a cement works there. Mm -hmm. So we know a little, I know a little bit about it, that it's very expensive for the cost of heating for the clinker yeah. oven. And you're doing a lot of measurements for the, for the uh, energy use. I saw lots of kilowatt hours and stuff like that. So how is this information being used to actually save money for the customer? Uh, first of all, they manage their consumption. Uh, they are a huge uh, energy cons consumption company. So what I need to do during the peak times, especially on the electricity side, they have to turn down, turn out the machines. So this is what they are, otherwise they get penalized. So the, once, they, once they come to a certain point, uh, they get penalized and the energy costs goes up. So the tariff uh, cost goes up. And they have to shut out the machines. And this is one way uh, they're using it because if uh, any of the machines is not turned off, they get the alarm immediately, so they turn it off manually. Uh, this is one thing. Uh, another thing is uh, when it comes to energy monitoring and not just 
uh, cement companies, but uh, everywhere else, we see the trend, trend that by uh, installing, <laughs> implementing energy management system to have consumption uh, under control, uh, you usually save up from 3 to 7% of energy quite fast without any huge investments. Why? Because, you know, people know that uh, the energy consumption is being controlled and if nothing else, they switch off the lights when they leave the office or they switch off the air conditioning. Uh, we had a really good example in our office building. Uh, when we moved in, uh, there were no energy management because there were no sensors, of course, and the, the temperatures were off, uh, air conditioning was running, 24-7 and so on. And once we implemented the energy management solution, uh, we saw that uh, we kind of uh, balanced all the consumption pretty well. So these are the use cases. Of course, when you're doing big industrial cases, when you're uh, doing energy audits, uh, you have huge potential for energy savings. Like, you know, the most plastic uh, example would be changing the bulbs, right? From regular to lit that already uh, brings some energy savings. Sure, so uh, I would maybe extend this question. Because it's not only about the energy saving initially, it's also having the monitoring to, in yeah. a lot of cases, be able to prove the saving when you did some improvement. Correct. So do you see that with your customers, if they're you know, coming with investments, with public subsidies, things like that? Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's, the that's always part. the case, actually. So uh, the, the idea is saving the, the energy. So. Once we do that, and this is why uh, I mentioned energy audits before, because this is usually how we sell our systems. Uh, we are an energy company. We are not just in business of IoT, uh, reselling different sensors. We are more or less focused on energy management. And the idea of energy audit is to make uh, analysis of current state and uh, take measures to cut down the energy costs. And this is how, this is why you actually need monitoring system. If you're not monitoring and managing your consumption all the time, it's going to slowly but surely increase again. Okay. And uh, we're doing this in uh, multiple cases from retail stores, cold chain management in SPAR retail stores, for example. Uh, that's actually a really good one. Uh, their temperature in some of the cooling houses, their temperature was were set to uh, one temperature lower than regulation. Why? Because the maintenance guy said, look, let's be on the safe side, let's go one temperature lower than the regulation uh, applies, and we're going to be okay. But that turn, it turned out that the cost of uh, the energy went up in that cooling house. So, and they didn't believe it. They didn't really believe that they're going to save the energy. Once they uh, set up the monitoring system, the energy management system, they those deviations showed up really fast. And you can take measures on that, take okay. actions. Perfect. So, uh, Dan, can I extend the same question to you? Um, can you, do you have an example where you have some like concrete numbers and ideas of saving in a project that you can share with us? Sure. So, uh, one of the biggest example is uh, uh, with a pretty simple measurement of soil temperature. So, with the Measurement of soil temperature, you can determine proper time of planting. Core needs minimum 8 degrees that he starts germination. If you put it in a land which has 7 degrees, you will extend, extend germination time to 30 days. Instead of 10, you will need 30 days to germinate. You lost 20 days when this corn could grow and use the energy and food from the soil and bring you a couple of tons more. So the another uh, very uh, dramatic example is that with this act, you are usually using 20 to 30 percent of your seed kernels because they have been attacked by the insects, by the animals, by the fungus. They start rotting, and you buy very expensive seed which you pay in hundreds of euros, and you lose 20 percent just because of one degree. And the second example, what is the, the second most expensive thing in agriculture? This is fertilizer. We know that it costs between 180, 300 euros, depend on type of fertilizer you use. 
for normal crop you need 200 kilograms of uh, nitrogen that it has enough food to grow. And then uh, your tractor driver said, okay, uh, it, it's a bit colder and dry, strong wind, but I will throw this fertilizer. So he comes in the field, brings a couple of thousand euros on, on his back, throw it on the field, there is not enough soil moisture, start melting, then uh, the wind is drying the soil surface, nitrogen is gas nicely going to the air, your phosphorus and potassium going into nice stone that is, will be placed on the, on the field, and neither of these three macro elements really came to the plant which you wanted to feed and to grow. So you lost everything. All right, thank you for that example. And Matiz, can you share some numbers with the vineyards, especially in California, which is a much drier area than here, where it's not that big of an issue. But like, what range of saving in water usage and money or you know, any terms? Can you share some numbers with us? Yes, that? so um, in this particular season, we ran some, let's say, measurements th throughout the whole season. Um, and to one particular grower that I don't know exactly the area, we saved roughly 50 Olympic swimming pools of water uh, in irrigation. It's one of the biggest ones, that's correct. Okay. Um, one of the biggest customers of ours, um, but yeah, the, our initial estimations were around 25 to 30 percent. Uh, I think we went even a bit higher. Uh, this is mainly okay. because of our organization. Uh, so there is also this fact that we can remotely control the valves uh, with the devices. And uh, one thing is to know what you want to achieve. The other thing is to actually execute this in the organization, therefore to have the person appointed to open or close the valves. And if you can automate this part, um, yeah, you can basically reach even higher savings than, than you would uh, reach if you still work manually. So these are the current figures. Perfect. So th this is very exciting. And as you can see, it's really about the use cases where you are optimizing the process or saving through the fact of just having the measurements and really being able to see what's happening. So uh, given that the time for our panel is up, I would like to invite our speakers uh, to join us at the tables outside to uh, be there for the next half an hour for the networking break. Um, so I will ask you all to meet them there, grab a coffee, um, ask them questions, chat, and really get close-up uh, information on how this is implemented in practice, as that can give you good ideas how to build new products, uh, build new solutions, um, and so forth. So the borrower will give you some more details on that one.